and this is not a problem. Likewise, reject instruction. Don't imitate the books that you read either. Where is the master who could have taught Shakespeare? Where's the master who could have instructed Franklin? Or Washington? Or Bacon? Or Newton? Every great man is unique. He goes on to say, Shakespeare will never be made by the study of Shakespeare. He said in one other phrase, the one thing I have against Hamlet is that it exists. Which is to say, it's out there, which means we're going to try to copy it, whereas what we should do is rival it. Do something on our own that's at, of that scale. So reject foreign models. Do not imitate. Reject instruction. Reject even genius insofar as it puts a kind of constraint on you and makes you slavish and servile. Emerson is also prepared to reject the frills of his own modern culture. This comes at a time when there's a kind of cheery optimism about American progress. It seems to be an indigenous feature of American society. And Emerson can be very caustic about how much we have actually progressed in this day and age. The civilized man has built a coach, but has lost the use of his feet. He is supported on crutches, but lacks so much support of muscle. He has a fine Geneva watch, but he fails of the skill to tell the hour by the sun. A Greenwich nautical almanac he has, and so being sure of the information when he wants it, the man in the street does not know a star in the sky. The solstice he does not observe. Equinox he knows as little. And the whole bright calendar of the year is without a dial in his mind. You now, that's part of the, the rejections that you have to be in touch with what's in yourself, and you have to be in tune with that flowing set of forces in the world. And I think in that last passage, we get a sense that it's the heavens and the stars as well as the oceans and nature. Now, self-reliance, as I said, is not, it doesn't seem to us to be a revolutionary notion. And what I've tried to get at so far is the way in which Emerson expands our view of it, it makes us realize the capaciousness of it, that it's outside of us, that it taps into other forces, that it, in a sense, allows us to reclaim the world. What I want now to do, after suggesting that this has moral problems, that we may offend the operative value systems, the authority systems of any particular culture, by being true to this inner instinctual reality, I want now to get at something rather different, which is I think one of the most exciting things in this essay, which is how difficult it is to be self-reliant if you're going to go the full route as Emerson does. What are the problems of being self-reliant? And what Emerson is going to suggest is that we have to rethink our notion of what a self is. And perhaps to give a modern term, of what a personality is, of what an identity is. The most unforgettable lines in this essay have to do with our need for consistency, our need for being more or less the same today that we were yesterday, last week, last year. That this is something that others expect of us, the world expects us to be reasonably the same, but worse still, it's something that we expect of ourselves. Emerson writes, the other terror that scares us from self-trust is our consistency, our reverence for our past act or word, because the eyes of others have no other data for computing our orbit than our past acts. That's all they know of us. They don't know that we are kaleidoscopic on the inside, that we could be anything. They know us by a small number of statements and gestures, our career, our established positions. They have fixed us. As he says, they have computed our orbit. It's a remarkable verb, isn't it? Written in the 1830s. And we are loath to disappoint them. How many times does someone hear, you're not yourself today? People tell you that. <clears throat> you want to say to them, well, who am I then? 
I'm not myself. What they're telling you is, you're doing something that is unlike what you have accustomed us to think you are. But you know that that too is in you. It's either dormant, you've said no to it up to now, whatever. It's part of your repertory, part of your makeup. What Emerson is going to attack in this essay is the notion of maintaining a self. Maintenance is going to go over the boards here, by the boards. Instead, he's going to suggest, don't give two thoughts to what you were yesterday, five minutes ago. It would be hard to get a lecture doing that, but that's what he's going to suggest here. It says about your consistency, why should you keep your head over your shoulder? Why drag about this corpse of your memory, lest you contradict somewhat you have stated in this or that public place? Suppose you should contradict yourself. What then? And he then goes on to these famous lines, which are really quite beautiful. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. It almost rhymes. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with his shadow on the wall. Speak what you think now in hard words, and tomorrow, speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words, again, though it contradict everything you said today. Aha! So you shall be sure to be misunderstood, he says. Is it so bad, then, to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood, and Socrates, and Jesus, and Luther, and Copernicus, and Galileo, and Newton, and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh. To be great is to be misunderstood. Well, this is something that people were just not used to, and I'm not sure we're used to it today. That this notion of being consistent, which is really a way of saying being coherent, having an identity, having a personality, Emerson is quite prepared to rupture that. He's quite prepared to be a merry-go-round, a roller coaster, a kaleidoscope, to be mercurial. He's aware of all of the possibilities that are in him, and they're all real. What he doesn't want to do is to falsify any of them or to reject them. So that sense of maintaining yourself is one of the worst enemies of self-reliance. To rely on yourself is to require a certain amount of courage. To be true to your instincts, that's why spontaneity is so important. That's why intuition is valued so much more than tuition. How do you know when people are sincere, authentic, original? Well, it won't surprise you that one way you figure it out is by their language. If a man claims to know and speak of God and carries you backward to the phraseology of some old moldered nation in another country, in another world, believe him not. Okay? If this comes with the old trappings, whether it's biblical or whatever, forget it. That's not in any sense related to the Godhead that is in you, that you can tap into. Speech then becomes an index of authenticity. Emerson also speaks of finding the light of the soul. And this is an astonishing philosophical line here. Time and space are but the physiological colors which the eye makes. Well, I was going to say something very close to this in Monday day. But the soul is light. Where it is, is day, where it was, is night. And history is an impertinence and an injury if it be anything more than a cheerful apologue or parable of my being and becoming. What a cavalier remark here. We reject history, we reject the past. Soul is light, and what we want to do is follow soul Follow our soul, it creates reality, it engenders reality, it engenders light, and where it no longer is, is dark. Don't worry about the lessons 
of the past. Learn to trust the soul, to see by its light, to reconceive time and space, which in fact he does. He reconceives time and space. He says that we are trapped. We're trapped particularly in time in this way that we either postpone or we remember. Huh? We all know it's true. The hardest thing in the world is to live in the present. We're constantly thinking either of what's to come or what has come. Man postpones or remembers he does not live in the present, but with reverted eye in the midst of the past, or heedless of the riches that surround him, stands on tiptoe, he says, to foresee the future. He wants to liberate us from that posture, to learn to live in the present and to see the world around us by the light of the soul. It's not easy to be spontaneous, to be true to one's inner light, one's inner resources. This is all that self-reliance consists of. And I'm going to close this by referring to his really quite, I think, difficult formulation about how this comes back to power and how the soul itself is not a static, timeless thing, but in fact moves. I said that light moves, what the soul produces light, and where it's not, it's dark. This is all mobile. Life only avails, not the having lived. Power seizes in the instant of repose. It resides in the moment of transition from a past to a new state, in the shooting of the gulf in the darting to an aim, listen to that wonderful vocabulary, shooting, darting. This one fact the world hates, that the soul becomes. This one fact the world hates, that the soul becomes. And that's, as I said, this is difficult. What does it mean that the soul becomes? Well, here's what he says it means. For that forever degrades the past, turns all riches to poverty, all reputations to a shame, confounds the saint with the rogue, shoves Jesus and Judas equally aside. The soul becomes, God moves. There's kind of Darwinian evolution here of spirit and of light and of soul, and the past models are past models. They are no longer divine, they're no longer filled with radiance. The soul becomes, I said this is mobile, this is cubistic. This is a way of saying that the world is taking new shape every day. Divinity is moving, metamorphosing, being relocated. We too move with it. That's what it means to live in the now. That's what self-reliance means, is to keep attuned, keep in touch with that flow. Thank you. Lecture six, it's the last of my lectures on Emerson, and I want predominantly to focus on two of his more obscure, but I think more provocative, more fascinating essays. One's called Circles, and then I spend most time with this really grand piece called Experience. In order to preface what is so unusual about these pieces, I want to circle back a little bit and talk about the way Emerson has been understood in the histories of American literature that have been written. There wasn't much history of American literature in the 19th century, although there was a lot of American literature. It wasn't really thought in the academy that American literature was something one could really study. And in the heyday of beginning to think about American literature as a discipline, which is really in the early years of this century, in the 20th century, we have a particular kind of taste that is reigning, and it's the moment of the great modernist, T.S. Eliot, uh, Faulkner, writers of that stamp. And what you get is a kind of view of American literature that changes the importance of particular writers. So everyone had known that Emerson was a very revered figure in the 19th century, but when people start writing 20th century histories of American literature at that time, he is essentially marginalized. And the reason for this is that the modernists privileged complexity and alienation. This is the moment when Melville is rediscovered, is pulled out of obscurity. 
This is the moment when Emily Dickinson, almost the moment when Emily Dickinson becomes readable. And even a figure like Whitman, who is much more self-evidently central to us than he was to 19th century readers, Whitman becomes valued too. Emerson, who was so central a figure, gets marginalized and gets written off as cheery, optimistic, uh, a kind of you know, dewy-eyed belief in American freedom, American democracy, all of these sorts of slogans. Whereas you get instead of you on the great American writer as an alienated countercultural figure writing against society, almost by definition undiscovered during his or her lifetime. Well, Emerson obviously, you know, is clearly indicted on that front. He was the most revered intellectual of his time. Well, that modernist reading gets it wrong. I mean, Emerson, in fact, can be plenty obscure and in fact moves, as his title says, in circles and is a more provocative, complex author uh, in these two essays that I want to look at than we have thought. He leads to the kind of thinking that we think of as the beginnings of modernism. We see this in the work of Nietzsche and we also see it in contemporary thinkers and philosophers like Michel Foucault about the way in which culture is something that is external, but that moves inside of people and makes up the actual complexity and character of their own subjectivity. We think of our subjectivity as being ours. That sense of a possessive pronoun is what gets in trouble. And I think Emerson is a very brilliant sort of precursor along these lines. I'm going to read you from circles a couple of passages one is, our life is an apprenticeship to the truth that about every, around every circle another can be drawn. That there is no end in nature. What he's really saying is that there are no boundaries, there are no lines. Everything we take to be horizons, contours, whether it's about truths, about values, about the phenomena of nature, the more we learn, the more we realize that they are inscribed in other patterns, that the world is serial, that the world is dialectical, that nothing has the kind of clarity, or authority, or hegemony that we're accustomed to. He also makes it clear, and this is the point that Foucault and modern writers have, have emphasized, but that no one has thought much to look for Emerson in this argument. He makes it clear that the coherence of any cultural moment is a strange thing. That it holds, it obtains for a while, and when a certain idea or two stops being believable, the culture dies. We can't read it anymore. It doesn't make sense anymore. And we'd like to think that certain things are timeless or that they're universal. These are very, very popular beliefs and they're much under fire in modern thinking. Emerson. Our culture is the predominance of an idea which draws after it this train of cities and institutions. Let us rise into another idea they will disappear. All of our institutions will become incoherent. They won't make any sense if the paradigm, which is Thomas Kuhn's famous word for it, if we have a paradigm shift and think we stop looking at the world the same way, then we will lose the secret, we'll lose the key, we'll lose the cogency of other cultures. And he gives a bunch of examples. He talks about Greek sculpture. We can't really understand it. We have it. We can admire it. But the secret, the genius of it, is alien to us now. He says the same is true for Greek literature, Greek, Greek civilization. That they depended on a particular set of informing notions. We call that discourse. That's the word that Foucault uses for it. That we are all always part of an operative discourse that we can't see, but that is the thread that holds together the fabric that we think of as intelligible things. Everything looks permanent, he writes, until its secret is known. What a sad remark. Everything looks permanent until its secret is known. And then we see how it was constructed, how it held for a moment, did its time, and is now a relic, something of the past. The key to every man is his thought, sturdy and defying though he look. He has a helm which he obeys, which is the idea after which all his facts are classified. Okay? 
that there is a governing point that makes things cohere. And if you shift that point, they stop cohering. So that there's a kind of cancellation that can be, obsolescence can be built into this. For it is the inert effort of every thought having formed itself into a circular wave of circumstance. As, for instance, and listen to his examples, an empire, rules of an art, a local usage, a religious right. The Roman Empire, I'm going to give you examples. Writing silence, taking tea, the Eucharist. It is the, it forms itself into a circular wave of circumstance to heap itself on that ridge and to solidify and hem in the life. And what he's saying is that there is a kind of indigenous energy that wants to reify things, wants to take our rituals, our constructs, our notions, and say, this is reality. And what he is suggesting, in a very bold notion here, is that this fights life. Life is change. Life is evolution. Life metamorphoses. The soul moves. The soul becomes. But instead, we have these structures, these rigidified, reified structures, often they're literally structures of churches and courthouses and things like that, where we want to say, this is the permanent, enduring, universal form of reality and of belief. He says it hems in the life. It becomes sterile. It becomes anti-life, counter-life. So there's something remarkably freewheeling about the thought that's expressed in this essay. You remember that first line? Every circle we will learn is circumscribed by still other circles. He's also going to write, there's no such thing as a wall. There's a very famous poem by Robert Frost called Mending Wall, where the wall becomes an emblem of a kind of parochial way of thinking. He says there aren't any walls in nature. There are no walls in reality. All of the demarcations and horizons are only horizons that we posit. They're not out there in the things themselves. Emerson has no illusions about the amount of havoc that this view will wreak. That this is the cause of war, discord, murder, and imprisonment, is when systems become challenged. When belief systems, think of religious systems, think of the cause of the wars that we've done, become challenged because another group says that's no longer viable. We don't believe that anymore. The new statement, he writes, is always hated by the old, and to those dwelling in the old comes like an abyss of skepticism. Wonderful choice of words. We call those people skeptics because they don't believe in what we believe in. They may have another belief system, but we call them skeptics because they have reject our so-called universal system. So that this is a view that embraces change, says change is part of the operation. And the people will fight it. They've always fought it. That's the history of the world. He knows this partly because of his own sense of his own mercurial identity. He is kaleidoscopic. There's a wonderful consonance in Emerson between his sense of what it's like to be a living person and his philosophy about the world and about reality. Our moods do not believe in each other. What a great line. Our moods do not believe in each other. When we're angry, that anger has forgotten that we were happy five minutes earlier. Our moods do not believe in each other. Today I am full of thoughts and can write what I please. I see no reason why I should not have the same thought, the same power of expression tomorrow. What I write whilst I write it seems the most natural thing in the world. But yesterday I saw a dreary vacuity in this direction in which now I see so much. And in a month, I doubt not, I shall wonder who he was that wrote so many continuous pages. Real sense of uh, ourselves as being discontinuous. Ebb, flow. No pattern there. That's what life is. Ebb, flow, evolution, metamorphosis. And so, could there be an ethos here? Well, you've already seen it in the essay on self-reliance. The ethos is to rely on this, to trust this, except he's going to express it in a more extreme term, which many of us, I think, would be reluctant to believe in, which is abandonment. He says we have to be surprised out of our propriety. 
propriety in the sense of holding on to ourselves, that self-governance that says, I am, after all, supposed to represent and then fill in the blank. We have to be surprised out of it. We have to lose our sympaternal memory. So we have to become amnesiac, to become free. Forget about the stranglehold of the things we've done in the past. To do something without knowing how or why. That's what we have to do. In short, to draw a new circle. The way of life is wonderful, and he means wonderful in the strong sense of the word, full of wonder. The way of life is wonderful, it is by abandonment. Abandonment. He doesn't mean getting lost. He means throwing yourself into yourself. Following instinct, enthusiasm. Now his great, that's all from circles. I want now to move to the even more astonishing piece, which is experience, which I think is very much indebted to the great final essay by Montaigne, whom, whom the French philosopher of the 16th century, whom Emerson revered, and about whom Emerson wrote, and whose final essay is also called De l'Experience, about experience. And there are a lot of parallels between them. This essay, which is titled Experience, you would expect to begin with the kind of confident sense that we have experience. And instead, it begins with the view that we live in a dream. Where do we find ourselves, first line? Where do we find ourselves? In a series of which we do not know the extremes and believe that it has none, we wake, this is the same imagery that T.S. Eliot's going to use, we wake and find ourselves on a stair. There are stairs below us, which we seem to have ascended. There are stairs above us, many of them, which go upward and out of sight. Here we are in the midst. We cannot see the horizons. We can't see the future. We can't see the past. We're in the murk. Sleep lingers all our lifetime about our eyes. This is, you know, all this wrecks any notion of having a confident, clear, lucid picture of things. As night hovers all day in the boughs of the fir tree, all things swim and glitter. It's a wonderful elasticity in this man, a capacity to absolutely be alive to and accepting of evanescence, instability, discontinuity, change. Murk? Yes, that's what it's about. Clarity is a fiction. And so there's a ghost-like sense of things at the heart of the enterprise here. Evanescence and change. And it's not clear that there is a unitary self. He gives a very moving example of this. He refers to the death of his own child. He says, the only thing grief has taught me is, how, is to know how shallow it is. And this is extraordinarily honest. Well, souls never touch their objects. He's talking about human love. An innavigable sea washes the silent waves between us and the things we aim at and converse with. Grief, too, will make us idealists, that is to say, to realize that only the world of the mind, our mind, is real. In the death of my son, now more than two years ago, I seem to have lost a beautiful estate no more. I cannot get it nearer to me. If tomorrow I should be informed of the bankruptcy of my principal debtors, the loss of my property would be a great inconvenience to me, perhaps, for many years, but it would leave me as it found me, neither better nor worse. So is it with this calamity. It does not touch me. Something which I fancied was a part of me which could not be torn away without tearing me, nor enlarged without enriching me, falls off from me and leaves no scar. It takes a lot of courage to write that after the death of the son. We know that he was moved and distraught. But he can write that even our most intimate and deepest relations are in some terrible way alien to us. They're not us. And the only reality is us. It's inside. He goes on in this essay to talk about the subjectivism of his time. And this is something that is consistent with 19th thinking, century thinking in general. And it's the sort of thing that is at the heart of a book like Moby Dick. Emerson writes, I've already suggested to you that we live in a dream world, Life 
is a train of moods like a string of beads. And as we pass through them, they prove to be many colored lenses which paint the world their own hue. Our moods are the way we see the world, and therefore they are the world. We forget that that's only our way of seeing. And each shows only what lies in its focus. Let's remember this notion of lenses. Our lenses are the way we come to reality. They're the operation that we perform on the world, but we don't see it. We don't know we're wearing these glasses. And it's not just the ideas we believe in. It's our moods. It's our temperament. It's what the Renaissance people would have called our humors. This has to do with how we act on the world, but it's an action operation, as I said, that is customarily invisible. Emerson finds remarkable language. He says, temperament is the iron wire on which the beads are strung. And he gives a lot of examples that if you're in a certain kind of mood, the world will not be the same for you. You will miss, you will walk by certain things that in a different frame of mind you would value the scene and that would have changed your sense of life. Listen to this. Temperament also enters fully into the system of illusions and shuts us into a prison of glass which we cannot see. That's those lenses again. He at one point says, we inhabit the temperament. Like we are the creatures, the inhabitants, the prisoners, the inmates of whatever temperament we have at a particular moment. That is life for us. Well, how do you solve this one? What solution? What would you tell people to do if this subjective grip is so strong and there can't be a kind of shared objective world out there? Emerson argues that what we need to do is to be all the more active, energetic, impulsive, and above all, not to waste our time theorizing. This is useful in today's academy, I think, this sort of advice. And he puts it in terms of education. Life is not dialectics. I wish that a lot of my colleagues could hear that. Life is not dialectics. We, I think, in these times have had lessons enough of the futility of criticism. Our young people have thought and written much on labor and reform, and for all that they have written, neither the world nor themselves have got on a step. Intellectual tasting of life will not supersede muscular activity. If a man should consider the nicety of the passage of a piece of bread down his throat, he would starve. In other words, if you just theorized about what it's going to be like, what operations, there are complex operations, that have to go into effect before a piece of bread can go into your throat, you're never going to eat. At Education Farm, the noblest theory of life sat on the noblest figures of young men and maidens, quite powerless and melancholy. It would not rake or pitch a ton of hay. It would not rub down a horse. And the men and the maidens left it pale and hungry. What we need is something vital, something that is invigorating. We need praxis, not theory. We need to be embarked in life and not simply to be speculating or forming notions about it. Now, how does he describe this praxis? You remember from the last essay, abandonment is the term. Give yourself over to the rhythm, rhythms and pulsions of existence. Listen to this phrase. Nature hates peeping. Nature hates peeping, like peeping times. Scientists are wires, you know, they're sneaking around trying to figure out secrets. What does it really mean? What's behind that? What's the secret there? Nature hates peeping, and our mothers speak her very sense, nature sense, when they say, children, eat your victuals, and say no more of it. That's the way to go through life. It's time to eat, eat. Don't theorize, don't talk. Children, eat your victuals. Say no more of it. To fill the hour, that is happiness. To fill the hour and leave no crevice for repentance or approval. And hear this remarkable line. We live amid surfaces. And the true art of life is to skate well on them. Do you realize a whole metaphysics of content, depth, secrets, the secret heart of things is being cashiered. It's being put out of business here. Life is surface. Life is the phenomenal surface world that we inhabit. It's the things we can touch. Let's live there. Let's not forget about that in some pointless, futile search for secrets and for meanings. The depth 
as a fiction. And here he turns inside out some of his own earlier notions. You recall at the very beginning, uh, when we talked about language, he said that the country people have a kind of pith that we have lost in the cities. Here he says that we would think that they're closer to life. We fancy that we are strangers and not so intimately domesticated in the planet as the wild man and the wild beast and bird. But the exclusion reaches them also, reaches the climbing, flying, gliding, feathered and four-footed man. Fox and woodchuck, hawk and snipe, and bittern, when nearly seen, have no more root in the deep world than man, and are just such superficial, in the literal sense, on the surface, superficial tenets of the globe. Then the new molecular philosophy shows astronomical interspaces between atom and atom, this is written in the 1830s and 40s, and shows that the world is all outside. It has no inside. And again, our metaphysics of depth, of going to the core of things, this informs our way of dealing with one another. We talk about deep feelings, deep ideas. We, superficial is a pejorative term in our culture. He's saying, no, no, it's the surface, and that's all we have. That's what's real. And the rest is speculation, and it keeps us away from, out of touch with, the surfaces themselves. His final summation is expressed in wonderfully biblical terms. Hear the humor of this. It's very unhappy, but too late to be helped, the discovery we've made that we exist. That discovery is called the fall of man. Ever afterwards, we suspect our instruments. We've learned that we do not see directly, but immediately. All of modern life comes under that idea. We don't see directly, but immediately. We wear lenses. We have blinders. We have frames. That's what this whole essay has been about. We have no direct access. We do not see directly, but immediately, and that we have no means of correcting these colored and distorting lenses, which we are, or of computing the amount of their errors. Perhaps these subject lenses have a creative power. Perhaps there are no objects, that's even stranger, that the lenses we have don't just distort things, they manufacture the whole world for us. They don't just give us a particular take on them, they're out there engendering the vision itself, all of it. Once we lived in what we saw, I guess that would have been when we were living in Eden. Now, the rapaciousness of this new power, which threatens to absorb all things, engages us. So there's a fabulous recognition here that we live in mediation, we live at a remove from things, that we have these lenses that are between us and the world, that we have these governing constructs that shape cogency, for us, all things are subject to change. People forget that it is the eye which makes the horizon. The horizon's not there, it's the eye. We construct it through our lenses, through our engendering vision, and he claims that we construct everything we see on it. We construct heroes, we construct saints. Jesus, the providential man, is a good man on whom many are agreed that these optical laws shall take effect. Christianity is an optical code that says that Jesus is the person who epitomizes providential man. And there will be a time when that will fall apart and another code will come about and this will be as esoteric or exotic to us as religions from tribal cultures that we don't understand anymore. All is perspectival. There's a remarkable wisdom in much of this. There's a sense here that we are cut off, and yet there's no blue funk in this essay. There's no sense that this is a kind of prison of relativity, which is how we would tend to think of it today. Emerson is going to argue over and over that this is a source of freedom. Here is a line of Emerson's thought that goes not only to figures like Nietzsche, that we are unsponsored, the death of God is one of the things he's talking about. But it will go on, as I said, to Foucault, it will go into the poets like Wallace Stevens. His term is that we are unsponsored and therefore free. 
there's a wonderful sense here in which self-reliance comes back into the picture. It is true that this self no longer has quite the credentials that it had in the earlier essays, and yet it is all we ever will have. That's why I said there's no sense of a blue funk here. This is a creative condition to be in. It's one that frees us. It is true that all the muses and love and religion hate these developments, he says, and will find a way to punish the chemist who publishes in the parlor the secrets of the laboratory. And we cannot say too little of our constitutional necessity of seeing things under private aspects or saturated with our humors. But he adds, and yet is God the native of these bleak rocks? It's a line that Wallace Stevens could have written. And yet is God the native of these bleak rocks? This is our landscape. This is our self. It is true we exist in mediation to the world, that we skate on the surface, and yet those bleak rocks, that's the divinity that we have. It's not in some sort of esoteric code anywhere. And there's cause for celebration. We must hold hard to this poverty, however scandalous, and by more vigorous self-recoveries after the sallies of action, possess our axis ever more firmly. Self-possession is really the project. That's the goal. And he ends up expressing it in language that reminds me a lot of his sort of predecessor, Voltaire, his most famous phrase is, il faut cultiver son jardin, one must cultivate one's garden, the kind of pragmatism that Voltaire puts forth is stay away from metaphysics, stay away from philosophy, stick to the here and now, to the basics. Here's how Emerson closes. We'll see that he turns a twist on this. We dress our garden, eat our dinners, discuss the household with our wives, and these things make no impression and are forgotten next week. These are the routine habits of a life. They're not part of us. They don't go down deep. But in the solitude to which every man is always returning, he has a sanity and revelations which in his passage into new worlds he will carry with him. You return to your solitude, mediated though your relation to the world is. Those are your riches. It's a bare landscape, but it is the only divinity that you will know. It is where God lives. It's the place of God. I said he is modeling this essay after Montaigne. Montaigne gives us the term, the, he calls it the arrière boutique, sort of the shop in the back of the shop. And he uses that as a metaphor for the human soul, that we all retire in some fashion to this back shop for our deepest transactions. And I think Emerson is being 100% loyal here to Montaigne, except that this back shop for Montaigne has become the only shop for Emerson. It is the full stage, but it's a huge stage. It's the inner resources of the self where we have to finally take root and find divinity. Thank you. Okay, guys. Thank you.